Coming up next on Boston Profiles, Karma Loop founder and CEO, Greg Selko. Hello, I'm Scott Mercer. Welcome to Boston Profiles, a new show at Boston Neighborhood Network, introducing viewers to individuals having a positive impact on many different levels throughout the great towns and cities of Boston. During each half hour, we'll learn a lot more about what makes these individuals tick, get their thoughts and opinions on many different issues, and learn how they contribute to the lives and well-being of others in the community. While you may know what they do for a living, you may not know how they became the person they are today. During our conversation, it's our hope that you enjoy getting a more intimate and engaging understanding of the path they took and how it shaped them. Joining me in studio today is Greg Selko, founder and CEO of Karma Loop, the largest online streetwear retailer in the world, according to Boston Magazine, and in the top 1,500 of most visited websites in America and top 7,000 worldwide. What makes his story so unique is that Mr. Selko earned a master's degree from Harvard in public policy and worked as an urban planner at the Boston Redevelopment Authority before he created Karma Loop. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be here. All right, Greg. Um, so let's talk about that little transition sure. there. You know, you have a master's degree from Harvard in public policy. You're running a streetwear e-retail store. Well, public policy and streetwear don't go together. That's not the first thing you think of. <laughs> Some say yeah, no. Yeah, right. I, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's interesting because my initial life path after college was to be an urban planner like my mother. Okay. And, uh, you know, I thought that's what I wanted to do. But I think, you know, I was always into this culture and the clothing and the music and, and, and so forth. And so basically, you know, it was something I started as a side project, but it was something that came from a really authentic place, even though I had no business starting a business because I had no clue what I was doing. Neither one of my parents were were business people or my fa in my family for that matter. So I really went in like naive and, and blind, which is probably a good <laughs> a thing. A good thing, right. Um, but you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of things that I learned at, when I was at the Kennedy School that I've been able to apply despite the fact that it was a public policy degree. There was a lot of, we, we had basic accounting and a bunch of economics and statistics and stuff like that that, that I've used. And you know, I think the, you know, one of the things we'll talk about obviously is that Carmel was very engaged in the community. Right. and so. I think that we've kind of come at this whole business from a public policy standpoint, even though we're definitely an e-commerce fashion business. Right. Um, we try to do a lot of things that help give back to the community or, or engage our consumer. And we really like to look at our, our website as sort of a lifestyle company, brand, media company that we monetize by selling products. So there's a lot more to it than just the clothing. Yeah, let's talk about that. You, you, cause Urban planning requires a lot of statistical data, a lot of mm -hmm. research, knowing what the residents want, knowing how it's going to impact the residents mm -hmm. in the community. So how did you do that with your mm -hmm. with, with, with Karma Loop in terms of streetwear? Because they seem to be a lot more impulsive than the residents yeah. of Boston or any other town. So how did you sort of make the two work together? Well, I think the, you know, uh, definitely, uh, you know, the urban planning piece of, of it really my my sort of skill when I was doing urban planning for the city was that I know the city really well. Right. I grew up here. I'm a native of, of uh, Boston. It turns out that uh, you know I'm a fourth generation Jamaica Plain. I with a little break in between, but <laughs> I, you know my my great 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 grandfather's buried in Forest Hills. Wow. So, okay. You know I, I I know the city. I love the city. I think the. Uh, Really where I was good is my intuition, my understanding of how it ticked and kind of the sense and feel, not the statistics, not that the type of thing. The pulse of it, the if pulse. you will. Okay. And that was the same thing with, with, with Karma Loop. I mean, I really didn't have, I, I needed other people to help me with that. I wasn't good at math. I got kept back a year when I was in, in school because I had such problems with math. So it wasn't about statistics or crunching numbers. It was really about, you know, having a, a, a kind of a, thir a sixth sense and intuition on what's going to work and and, and what the culture really means. And how did it evolve from the basement of your parents' apartment or house in Jamaica Plain into a worldwide internet success? Well, I mean, 
a Especially lot of, a not lot. knowing math. Uh, <laughs> that's just amazing, and that's great for people listening because yeah. that means that just because you have some sort of obstacle to overcome doesn't mean yeah. you can't be successful. Right, well, they have these things called computers now, which really <laughs> are helpful with the math problem. Um, but the, so basically, you know, the, the, it started in my parents' basement. I was working at the BRA at the time, and I can assure you I was still busting my ass. Anyone who knows, knows me knows I wouldn't, do, you know, have it impact my work at the BRA, and I have a lot of energy. So I work at the BRA all day, then I work on my business all night, and, and so forth. And my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, she and I were the only customer service, fulfillment, <laughs> you name it. I was down there packing boxes. My mom's worried what the hell's gone <laughs> into this kitty's in the basement all the time. Right. Um, but... I think the way we were able to grow the business, because I didn't have a ton of money, I was fortunate enough to have some money that I put in. I put in probably about $26,000, $27,000, which was all the money that I had saved. Uh, I was able to get my uh, dad to put in some money. You know, uh, At that time, I think it was about $50,000. So I mean, okay. I, I was fortunate I had that, that advantage. But I, I really had to leverage the, what I had, because compared to what a lot of other internet startups would start up with, Right. 10, 20 Venture million dollars. Venture capitalists, absolutely. I mean, a VC wouldn't probably let me in the door at that point. They didn't. I had no knowledge of how that, that community worked or anything like that. So right. what, what we did really to, to get out of the basement was that each person who bought from us, I would call up and be like, hey, how'd you find out about us? And they were very enthusiastic. So I kind of enlisted them in the cause. It was really a very grassroots uh, thing from the, you know, calling someone up saying, all right, I'll promote you in Toronto. I'll promote you in you know, in my town, because I think what you guys are doing is cool, and I'm okay. sick of shopping at the Gap in Old Navy. Um, so it really just snowballed from that, and it's sort of something that kind of became viral and started growing. Um, I mean, there's, it's a lot more complicated than sure. that. Sure, yeah, I mean, that's a short answer, if you will. Right? But the short answer is just we really got help from people, and people wanted to help, and they wanted to be part of something. Well, I think what's significant is here you are growing up in JP, which is very well known for grassroots efforts, and that's how you built a company out of it. So that, yeah. that, you know, that shouldn't be lost on anybody in that regard. Well, I mean, it's interesting because I did, you know, I grew up here, I grew up hearing about like the Southwest Quarter fight and, uh, you know, Look, in Jamaica Plain, they'll cut. They'll have a. They'll activate the the community for any issue that they think is going to be a problem. Against Whole Foods, yeah, whatever, right? Whatever, whatever it takes. <laughs> right. I mean, it's an incredible, I mean, maybe sometimes a little extreme, but I think right. that in general, it's a pretty amazing thing. They really, there's a real belief that you have a right to speak up and say, right. and I think, look, I'm not comparing what we're doing with our business, we're making money sure. um, to grassroots activism, but I think, you know, seeing that, I think I took some things that I Absolutely. learned from it. Absolutely, uh, You know, that, that really the, the grassroots, it can be incredibly powerful. And the thing is, the way you make grassroots work is authenticity, and you can't buy that. And someone couldn't just throw $100 million now and create Karma Loop. You know, right. you have to, we did, had years of genuine interaction, true love and understanding of the culture that we were marketing to. And that, that's what worked. If you, can't, if, you're not, if you don't have that, the grassroots piece of it doesn't work. And I've read in my research that you actually went to your Pumas, your Reeboks, your Adidas, and you said, look, we're not going to order, have a big order from you, but what we can guarantee you is we're going to represent you very well. Correct. Uh, tell me what that was like. I mean, you're sitting here with these guys who probably, it was hard to get a meeting, I'm sure. Yeah. But once you did, you were able to convince them to do that. Well, f first of all, I can be very persistent. I don't give up. So <laughs> okay. they probably gave me a meeting just to, so I'd leave them alone, right? <laughs> um, but I think the, uh, the we, we were talking earlier off the air, and yep. not to, to kind of go off the, the track here, but about Boston and the fashion scene here, and it's difficult to create a fashion business. But one thing we do have in Boston, which was very... Uh, helpful is the sneaker. There's a lot of sneaker companies That's here. Right. I don't think the city recognizes it. I don't think the city does enough to promote it. Yep. It could be a, a tremendous, believe it or not. I mean, most people outside of this world wouldn't understand, but if you had promoted it more, you could, you could generate millions in tourism because the, 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 the sneaker culture is massive. You know right. what I mean? Kids collect sneakers. I have 500 pairs of sneakers. Yeah, I read know? that about you. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, my, it's amazing, except if, if you're my wife. She's not, she's not too pleased. <laughs> well, usually yeah. it's her with the shoes, yeah. but it's you with the sneakers, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Right? She, she thinks I'm like a Mel DeMarco. <laughs> so go ahead. Tim, but but yeah. so because they were local, I was able to really work my network and get in there and meet with Puma, meet with New Balance. Um, Adidas is now local. They have an office at the Reebok, you know, uh, headquarters. Reebok is obviously local. Saucony's Jazz were really big when we were starting out. Right. Saucony's right here. Pro Keds. So, you know, I, I think that was an advantage. And I was able to leverage my relationships with these guys to get this really unique product because 
they generally didn't, the stuff that they were giving us online, they were mm -hmm. giving to boutiques only. Okay. And it's their limited edition specialty product. And so one, we got cachet in the industry when we went to clothing brands and other people were like, damn, how do you get those, you know, right. those Pumas Special editions, online? Right. That gave us, you know, credibility and clout. So, you know, uh, they really trusted us to give us some of these accounts that they hadn't previously given any online. Well, businesses. what prevented them from just putting it online themselves? Well, I think the the it's a it's a complicated sort of understanding of the culture, but they ha they don't want to sell their limited specialty product mm -hmm. on, on themselves because it's about the cosign, it's about who they're working with, you know. They sell, uh, I mean, what they'll sometimes do if they sell it themselves is they'll do a pop-up site, like if, if Nike's doing something around a pair of Dunks or whatever, they'll create, you know, or the Yeezys that they did with Kanye, they'll right. create an environment where they, they might sell them. They didn't do that with the Yeezys, but I'm just using this right, as an example. Sure. Um, they don't want it mixed in with all the other product. They don't want you to feel like you can just go to Reebok site and buy the stuff because right. it takes away the specialty. Our, we are definitely a fashion uh, boutique, so they want their fashion sneakers and sneakers are certainly a massive fashion accessory now just like denim um they're not they're not just for ath athletics so they want them to be in the boutiques where they have other cool brands and things like that so were you essentially their street team online would you say that i mean is that a good analogy or no um probably not the best analogy okay sure. uh, and the reason why i say that is because you know the street team sort of out there promoting right. we're out there we were the street team for Carmel Loop out there promoting okay and basically they they had their street teams. They had their their people out there. But what they got, we wanted people more to feel like, anyways, that when we had these specialty products, that, that it was discovered and it got, got kind of disseminated. Not that we were out there okay, pushing I those. What you're saying. We were pushing the, the store itself. But the idea was people come in and they're like, "Wow, they got this." Right, and right. you know, it was more of the idea that we have some of these brands, and then people would come in and see what the products were. So I mean, yeah, I, I guess in a way it could be, but I think. It was really more about us being able to do some volume online, mm -hmm. which everyone likes, but still maintain the cachet of some of these limited products. Right, right. Sounds good. All right, we're going to take a break. Sure. Um, we'll continue our conversation with Greg Selko, CEO and founder of KarmaLoop.com after this short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to Boston Profiles. I'm Scott Mercer, and we're talking with entrepreneur, streetwear fashion mogul, urban designer, and visionary Greg Selko, founder and CEO of KarmaLoop.com. So when we went to break, we were talking about how you were able to get the major sneaker companies in Boston to actually uh, distribute their product through you guys with Karma Loop. Mm -hmm. What I want to move to now is we talked briefly or touched upon it was the fashion of Boston. Mm -hmm. um, how does Boston get into, you know, streetwear? I mean, because streetwear, when you hear that, that sound or, or a term, it's urban, it's cool, it's hip, it's underground, it's all of those things. Mm -hmm. How were you able to establish something like that in Boston, which is, you know, a lot of people say is traditional and historical and all mm -hmm. that? Well, I, I mean, I think uh, one of the things that we have done is we haven't completely abandoned the idea that it's traditional and historical. I mean, we just launched a website called Boylston Trading Company, which is, you know, because of the, you know, it's called Boylston Trading Frog Lane Goods is the long, because Frog Lane <laughs> okay. was the name of Boylston Street beforehand. It's all of our okay. super limited collabs. It's higher end stuff. It's run by this guy, Frank the Butcher, who's basically one of the most. That's a great name. Yeah. Because <laughs> he takes brands and chops it up and puts them together. That's okay. right. And he's like the world famous dude for doing collabs. And he's here in Boston. He started Concepts, which is another streetwear store here. Um, believe it or not, the, you know, the, the kind of the main street in Boston might not even know this, but Boston's a little, a little, uh, is on the map for streetwear. We have stores like Bodega and AWOL in Brighton. I mean, Bodega has been... Yeah, I've heard about Brighton. My son told me about that, my 16-year-old, yeah. right? It's a bodega, but you go behind the door or something? Exactly. Okay. It's, a, it's got the trap door and you go in the back, so your son knows what's up. Yep, yep, yep. yep. I hope he shops at Carmel. I, he will now if he isn't already, <laughs> right, trust <good>. me. <laughs> uh, but basically, you know, the it's concepts... Uh, there was a store called Lace, so there was actually some some real life here. Considering we were punching way above our weight for a streetwear 
city. And I think, you know, I'd like to think Boston, uh, that, that Carmel had something to do with Boston being in that position. Because, I mean, right. the guys who started Bodega used to work for me. Okay. We've had a lot of, uh, Frank the Butcher works for us now. He had worked it. So I think that we've definitely helped elevate that scene. But you'd be surprised. I mean, streetwear is not, a, is very accessible. I mean, especially lately, the last couple of years, the whole movement, when you look at people like Kanye Pharrell, I mean, they dress That's right. cashmere sweaters, and it's, it's it actually very we preppy. We call it preppy in my day. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> okay. actually very preppy. So <laughs> I think, you know, so I think some of Boston's heritage, I actually have my own personal clothing line that we're, we're going to launch in the fall okay. in 2012, and it's called Sons of Liberty, and I use the whole, like, the Sons of Liberty, obviously. And you heard it here yeah, first. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Thank you, Mike. Go no, ahead. No, so it's a, it's a, a, national, a worldwide announcement that there was launched. There we launching. go, baby. But, I mean, <laughs> basically, we use a lot of imagery from Boston and stuff like that. Oh, cool. Okay. And so I think that, I mean, obvi obviously, it's not the first city you think of when you think of fashion, but I think, like I said before, when we were talking offline, like, yeah. I think we're most improved. I've seen a tremendous Im improvement. I think the students coming from all over the world have a huge impact on that. Uh, I mean, there are there are things happening here relative to other cities our size. We're mm -hmm. doing pretty well. Um, I think we could do better, and I'd like to see us do better. But I mean, look, we're we're a company doing that's doing 130 million dollars in, in in revenue at Carmel.com. Um, we have Plunder.com, which is plndr.com. Yep. It's going to did 20 million this year. We have. Um, uh, Carmel Loop TV. Carmel Loop TV, Boylston Trading. We're launching a skate site called Brick Harbor. So I think we, Boston has been impacted by Carmel Loop itself. I mean, we have 170 employees now in the city That's of great. Boston. Um, you know, we've we, we got to be one of the fastest growing companies in the, in the state. We grew by 65% last year. We, sh we think it's not we, the country. That's, uh, that's pretty, at this time, yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, no, I mean, we're doing well. We're doing yeah. well, and I appreciate it. So thanks, everyone, for uh, supporting. But, you know, I, we bring a, a lot of the people who work for, I'd say 80, 80, 85% of the people who work at Carmel come from someplace else. And, you know, another thing that we talked about is sort of the perception of Boston. That's right. And that's one of the challenges is getting people from New York and L.A., to move, move to Boston, and once they do, it's they, a lot of their concerns. Some of them are actually they, they're still complain, right. and some of them they actually realize are, are, aren't so bad. But I think you know, our if you came to our, our office, and certainly if you want to ever do a follow up, whatever I can absolutely. Do, I mean, it's definitely the I will I will stake my my reputation and name on right now. It's got to be the most diverse company in the entire 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 city. We have no majority race. No, uh, you know, the, the, there's people from, from Japan who have come to move here, from every country around the world, every major religion's represented. I mean, it is definitely an extremely diverse place. And that's not... How do... Yeah, okay. To I, us, that's not that big a deal because right. it's really about define... It's about the culture itself. We right, all define you're in our, that space. In space right, right, exactly. So we define ourselves first by our shared feelings. So right. it's not really that big a deal. But a lot of people from outside who come in are like, whoa. And let's talk about it. that. How do we... First of all, how did it start that way, and then how do we shatter that image? Because as I've traveled throughout the country, we talked about yeah. this offline, you've traveled around the world, and when you hear Boston, people go, how could you live there? Oh, that's mm. a racist town. Oh, yeah. you know, and I had to defend, well, that was back in the 70s. I'm a New Yorker. I can tell you that yeah. it's not the way it was in the 70s, nor is anywhere else for that matter, okay? Yeah. So how do we take it past the reputation, how do we beat that, you know? Well, I mean, the first thing I'd say is should a city that's four, close to 400 years old be defined by its worst moment in its history, which is the busing crisis. Right. Charles Stewart was sort of on the tail end of that. That's it was right. the race riots and stuff. I, you know, I don't, I don't think so. I understand why people, we haven't done enough to dispel that image, but the, the, here's some realities. One is that Boston is, there's no majority race in the city of Boston anymore. Uh, you know, so f over 50% of the city is non-white. Huge percentage, I don't want to give the wrong percentage, but a huge percentage of the people who live in the city have moved here in the last 10 years. A lot of the people who are involved in busing don't live in the city anymore. They left. Um, and so, you know, uh, and the people who stayed who were in that time are the people who were more open-minded and who, who understood that the, it was ridiculous and a, and a horrible, shameful mark on our, our city's, you know, reputation. But I think there, there's a lot of work there's a lot of work to be done uh, to to improve our reputation internationally. I think Carmel Loops helped because we serve right. Carmel Loops TV. We shoot a ton of video here. It's shot in Boston. It shows a different side. Um, you find I think younger kids don't know that history. Um, but you know, if you go into, into uh, Carmel Loops, the the uh, out of the 13 department heads, eight of them are African American. 
almost all of them came here from other places. Okay. Many of them relayed stories to me, like Leandro who runs Plunder. His dad was like, oh, be careful. Be yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's racist, you know. Right. And um, he happens to live in Cambridge now, but I think he's, he's been pleasantly surprised that, you know, that I think... That, that his father's fears were not fact. Correct. And, and, that, and that the people genuinely understand that that's a perception and want to actually go out of their way to try and, you know, Shatter disprove it, yeah. that. But that being said, I think in terms of the environment for entrepreneurs, I still think, you know, Wired Magazine did the top uh, 10 mo best cities for entrepreneurs and Boston wasn't in it. You know, and it City wasn't in it. It was not in it. Wow. New York City was in it. You know, obviously Silicon Valley, was, you know, Palo right, Alto right. was number one. But even with MIT, Harvard, et cetera, and technology 128, still not. Right. And I mean, that's just one person's opinion. Sure. But I think Boston has now slipped to number three in, okay. in terms of VC money invested. It used to, in real dollars used to beat New, beat New York. And there's a lot of other people nipping at our heels. And right. I think there's a lot of coasting going on in Boston where we're just saying, hey, you know, we got MIT, we've had, but you know, we lost Facebook, we lost Microsoft. Those people were here first. Exactly. And they That's, went and we talked about that offline. How do we retain that talent? How do we, you know, keep it coming and, and, and don't let them go to Palo Alto and make, you know, a billion dollar company? Well, and I think they could do it here. Well, I think it's a challenge, I think, but I think we can do it. One of the things is, you know, I, I started a nonprofit called the Future Boston Alliance, which is brand new. Okay. Um, we're going to be doing more publicly in, in the spring. And basically the concept is to create a network that helps uh, retain entrepreneurship and but by doing it, by improving the quality of life issues in the city, by advocating for better taxi service and late night tea, mm -hmm. because what, where, and also connecting different people. So there's two, two criticisms I think of, we get of Boston. One is it's boring, it's no fun, the mayor hates nightlife, you know, you can't, you can't, it's hard to do anything, it's hard to get permits, all that stuff. And then the second thing is that everyone's very insular, right? Right. The different it's groups, the towns, and yeah, 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 sure. Like the different, you know, the the artists maybe don't work with the fashion designers and right. stuff like that. So the goal would be to kind of, you know, the, the rules are a little bit harder, or changing the, the the cultural environments a little harder. Okay. We're going to work on that. And then the second thing is trying to bring together different groups that are doing things that are creative or interesting, both entrepreneurial, but people who are established like a Puma, like a Rue La which is a big fashion site that's based in Boston. They do more business than us. They're more higher end stuff. Okay. So, I mean, there are things going on here, but I think, you know. Everybody's look, in their own fiefdom. Yeah. So we have to actually figure out how to bring everybody together. Correct. And, you know, the, the comment you make about, you know, people say about the mayor, oh, he doesn't like nightlife, yeah. et cetera. That's not true, mm -hmm. correct? I mean, he wants to see commerce in Boston, I would assume. I mean, I, I would say it is true. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I think, the, I think the, the city looks at nightlife and things as a nuisance. And, okay. not a, and there, there have been problems, so I can understand sure. par partially. But I think, look, when you have a, a mayor that's been in office for 20 years and is going to run again, to an outsider who comes to the city, it's right. kind of smacks of, of, you know, the Middle East or something okay. like that. Okay. And I think, you know, it's, for, it's forbidden in this town to be critical of, of the mayor, okay. uh, which I think is, a, you know, there, we set up this whole environment where, you know, if, if you don't get along, you got to get out. Okay. You know what I okay. mean? And that's right. not a good thing. So more collaboration is yeah. what we're looking at here. And so you're either sort of in the, in the, you know, in the good graces or not of, yeah. of, of the mayor. And I think there's too much power concentrated in, in, in that office. And I think it's, we need, a, we need the mayor to understand entrepreneurship better. I okay. think you just saying, hey, look, we have an innovation district, which is great. Yep. They've done some things that isn't enough. And they need real smart people who are young and are entrepreneurs and get it to be his liaison. I right. No, that because makes he, sense. He, I don't think, you know, he's, he's, he is who he is. Right. I, I'm sure, you know, he means well. He's done a lot of he's good things. He's done a lot of great things, sure. But, you know, I don't think he's in tune with young people in this city, and I don't think young people see him as anyone they can relate with. And I think that's a problem that it, when people feel like if they have a party, they're going to get in trouble, or if they want to start a street festival, they can't get a permit, or if they want to open a restaurant, the process is so long and so arduous. And if they don't know the right people, they don't hire the right person who knows the right people in City Hall, you can't do it. And that makes the city a closed society. If we want to be open to the world, we need it so that there's a level playing field that you don't have to just 
be in the good graces of the mayor in order to get anything done. Okay, and so will that, the alliance that you're forming, will that be something that you can go to the mayor and say, hey, let's work together, let's get these things done, because I can show you, you know, there, there, there's profit here, there are yeah. taxpayers, you know, there are a lot of good things that can happen, and then any concerns that he has sort of manage that based on that level. Because I know, you know, look, if you look at Government Center, where they do in the summertime, these great mm -hmm. concerts outdoor, yeah. and you don't see that kind of diversity in a lot yeah. of places, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But beyond that is what you're talking about, where you're actually sort of, you know, inviting entrepreneurship and you're inviting young people to have a, a seat at the table to mm -hmm. really build the city out. Is that what you're talking well, about? Well, I, I think it's also, it's quality of life issues. Okay, you know? So okay. That, that matter to entrepreneurs. Because they're not entrepreneurs, because because they're, they're, they're not from, you know, sort of see what on the ground what they need, they, right. they don't... For instance, just this is an example. It's not a big one, but yep. taxi cabs don't use their lights on the on the on the on, on the, the top. top. That's right. Right. So most entrepreneurs want to live in the city, not necessarily own a car. They bike. They use cabs. They use public transportation. Right. I, if I want a cab, and I and I use cabs a lot to get around, which is what is done in a lot of cities That's that right. are more friendly to entrepreneurship. I got to flag down 10 cabs and I run up in the pouring rain. There's people sitting in the back and they're like, no, 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 no. Because you have no idea that right. there's anybody in it. In uh -huh. there. And it's just, these are tiny little things. Uh, they don't let you use the credit cards oftentimes. They come That's up with right. I've heard In New York, that. they don't do that. You can always use your credit card in New York. They're just accepted. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a, these little things that are important to entrepreneurs who want to live in the city and want to be able to use the city in a very, you know, uh, sort of, um, on a street level, street, community yeah. level way, right? I yeah. mean, because again, taking cabs, getting on the T, you want that accessibility. I think you mentioned earlier that the T closes at a certain time yeah. where instead of 24 seven, or you, at least on the weekends, it's 24. Yeah, you know? I, I think, I think look, you know, care, I, look, it's expensive and the T mm -hmm. ties to do the best job right? they yeah. do. It. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that, you know, understanding some of these concerns and trying to do stuff, stuff more for, for for this group is really important because we're competing with the whole world and we are losing them. I mean, the fact is that there's been articles recently in the Herald and other places how we're losing young people. It's a tough city when you're between the ages of 24 and 35. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a lot of people say, you know what? We talked about this. Earlier. I'm going to New York. I'm going to San Francisco. That's right. Because it doesn't, it does have sort of a, 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 an environment that doesn't foster that group. It's either very focused on college kids or very focused on business adults, uh, you know, adults, you empty yeah. nesters who moved in the city or other people, and that group feels very left out. And, and the mayor had started something called One in Three, and we would love to work with them. You know, it, it's really, I think it's just to be clear, this isn't the organization we're creating is not a political organization. No, I understand. It's really we it's just want to work. Together, with, we yeah. want to bring, bring people together. But to be effective, in, and I think there's a problem uh, in the city that there's this real sense that you can't make any criticism. And to be effective, and if you really care about something, I wake up every day and say, what is Carmel Loop doing wrong? I want to hear from my employees what we're doing wrong. I want the best people in the positions. And them to, that, that, for them to tell me, hey, look, this is what we need to do. I don't feel like that, that's an environment in this city because when you have someone who's been in for long, office for a long time, it's an entrenched power, right. particularly someone who's known for being sensitive and being, uh, having thin skin. And you don't get an environment where you can be critical. And, the, and then crit find, solutions find solutions to those criticisms. Because you're, you're walking key. on eggshells. Yeah. You're yeah. worried. I and understand. I'm in a very unique position because... Because you're independent. Independent. And my, my, my business is all over the world. And if, you know, but other people feel beholden. And I think... I don't think it's whether it's done out of intentionally or not, there right. needs to be real dialogue where we can say, guys, we love this city, we love Boston, but here's where there's problems. And we really need to not just sit around and pat ourselves on the back. But if address those address issues. Those. If yeah. we want Facebook, the next Facebook here, we have, we have to address to make some them. changes on that. Greg Selko, thank yeah. you, man. Thanks, Scott. Great information. I yeah, appreciate it, was great. it, man. Appreciate it. That's all for this edition of Boston Profiles. I'd like to thank my guest, Greg Selko of Karma Loop once more, and thank you for joining us. For more information about Karma Loop or any other information you've heard on today's show, please visit our website at bnntv.org where you can find a wealth of information about BNN and our many programs and opportunities. Simply click on the contact tab and take it from there. We look forward to hearing from you. That's all for this week. Be sure to join us next week when we talk to another innovative, successful, passionate individual on Boston Profiles. Until then, we wish you continued success in all your endeavors. I'm Scott Mercer. Take care. Great. Thank you very much.